Welcome to the first section of Gardening Hacks with me, Bonnie Guinness. I'm in my garden in Cambridgeshire in the East Midlands near Stamford, and this is actually um, my vegetable garden, but I've got fruit and I've got lots of cutting plants as well. I'm a qualified landscape architect. Um, I'm passionate about landscape design, but I did do a horticultural degree from Reading University first, and I would say plants are my equal passion. I love them both equally. So this first session that we're doing is about, the first bit is about summer pruning, and then it's about seed sowing, and then it's about watering. And um, I'm now talking about pruning, and as you can see, I've got a fruit tree here, which is a trained fruit tree. This is what we call a devil's pitchfork because there's a U, an outer U, and then in it, there's an inner U. And as you can see, it's a little bit fuzzy. And when you do summer pruning, this is particularly for these sort of trained fruit trees, espalier, ones in, confined in pots, um, and things like that, then mainly we do it for those. I mean, I do it for a host of other things as well, but this bit is, is for those. Now we did have a question that was pre-submitted and I'm just gonna read you out to you, it out to you because it does relate to this. And it's from Alexandra, hello Alexandra. And she says, I'm a beginner garden in Cambridgeshire and I've just moved to a south facing garden with two long wooden fences. I've been considering growing espalier fruit trees. Do I have any advice as to how to get started? Now espaliers are essentially very similar to this and they are grown with horizontal planes. So you'd have horizontal, horizontal, horizontal. Um, and then you have the one vertical and you keep the growth restricted to the horizontal and I think they're a wonderful way to decorate a fence. If it's one of those ubiquitous sort of orange coloured timber garden fences I would probably knock it back with a paint colour like a sludgy green or something so it's not so prominent. Um, and if she says she's a beginner um, then I would actually go for to buy a pre-formed espalier. You can do them yourself, uh, but perhaps for a beginner, it's a little bit of an ask. Um, and then she will buy probably one with three tiers and she, it will be on an M106 rootstock. And I don't want to get too technical, but rootstocks actually control the growth and they are the base, the root of the plant. And then you graft onto it the variety, the top growth. And so because she's got two long fences, I would go for a whole range of different varieties along that fence, all on the M106 rootstock, but she could have an early apple, a mid apple and a late apple. So the early apples will just be ripening about now. And then the later apples at the other end will be um, good for keeping and things like that, the, the russets and ones like that. But choose ones that she loves. And to have a good variety of apples, she might be able to keep herself in apples for most of the year. But why do we do summer pruning? I think a lot of people get very confused with summer pruning because most people think you cut everything back in the autumn. Um, but the actual reason that we do summer pruning is because we want to create more fruiting buds as opposed to vegetative buds. I don't know if any of you have actually gone into an overgrown orchard and hacked it back like mad in the winter. And then the next growing season, you get a mass of watery young shoots because it just goes bonkers. It puts on lots and lots of vegetative growth. Now, if conversely, you cut back at this time of year, so it's really the end of August, beginning of September, it should really almost be called autumn pruning, then you will make the tree produce more fruit buds than vegetative buds, so you will get more fruit. And those fruit buds are a round, fatter bud than a vegetative bud, which is much slimmer. So with these, obviously, you want lots of fruit and you don't want a mass of a feathery growth because it just looks a mess. So that is why you do it now. That's one reason. The other good reason is I want more sunshine to come to my apples. So if I cut back a lot of these tall, straggly growths, I will get more sun and they will ripen better. So that's another very good reason to do it. And also, it's for decoration. You want to keep the form of the plant. You want to keep it restrained. So that's another reason you cut it back. Um, and so I'm going to actually start cutting them back now. And with these, you can see all this growth is actually all made this year. Very whippy growth. And so I'm going to cut it right back. 
and there is actually on most things a, a, a crown of basal leaves around the bottom of the new growth and if you cut to a bud a slanting bud just to that point a bud and then a slanting cut sorry just to that point you do always cut slanting towards the bud to slide the water off it and to keep it growing and it is a very quick job it's quite a nice job i'm using a pair of nice secateurs um, i'm not being overly careful all these things coming from the base i don't want this is obviously just the root stock because you can see it's quite different and it's going here so I want to cut that right back because I don't want the rootstock taking over um, I want to have the actual grafted thing on the top of it um, this plant I don't actually know what variety it is it came from a skip at Chelsea all these four trees um, came from a Chelsea garden um, and th they are lovely specimens but they are never labelled um, and you see it just quickly neatens up the whole tree. Now I have also got some taller ones which are actually grown as espaliers but they're on a trunk. So they're like a pleach tree. So I've got a long trunk and then I've got them at the top. And those are quite an interesting form. People don't realise that you can get fruit trees like that as well. Now I'll quickly go on over it like that. But if I've got the top ones, and I think two things that I really like for pruning, um, slightly high things, are my little paparazzi ladders, which I love because they're light and they're fairly stable. Um, and it means you can just do things without being at a really awkward angle and stretching and you can see what you're doing better. So I love those. And they also, I also have these, which are my favourites which are these lovely long handle ones. Now you can see the tie on this has gone, but these are really nice. They take a little bit of coordination to start with um, and they haven't been shut, as you can see, I've just missed that one. But uh, if I can get in there. And they, they work really nicely. And now all these bits have come off. Um, I will actually not be chucking them on the compost seat. They will go to the cattle and the sheep and they just love them. So what other things do I summer prune at this time of year? I've got apple trees in baseless pots and they are on a very dwarfing rootstock. So they would be M27 because you really don't want them to grow big. And so those I will come on and I will actually cut back again where they've got too big so I'm restricting them and any that aren't growing so well I will probably leave for an aut for a winter prune because that will encourage them to make more vegetative growth so they will get bigger and the same really with these family apple trees it's a common problem that people have is they have a, a family apple tree so that's one rootstock and on it are grafted four different varieties so you might have a russet a coxidon an orange pippin um, a granny smith and a golden delicious and what happens is usually the, the variety that's growing near the sun or the most vigorous variety will go huge and the other three will look rather pitiful in comparison so when you're pruning something like that, I don't really time things that well. I will just go and when anyone is looking too vigorous, I'll just snip it back. Um, and then hopefully you will keep the whole thing in balance. But you need just to use your judgment with something like that and don't get too hidebound by doing things at the time of year. Just go at it whenever you feel like it. Um, the other thing that I think it is important to remember with pruning is that they always say growth follows the knife. And what that means is if you've got a shrub and again one side is performing massively and the other side looks a bit sad, you would actually go and cut back the, the side that's not growing so well more than you would the side that's growing well. So it's totally counterintuitive. And this is because where you cut it will shoot and grow more. So by cutting it, you're spurring growth. Um, and that is the reason why, we're, we're, why we are actually cutting it now. We're cutting these late, the fruit trees late August, early September, because if we cut now, it's past the warm period, coming past the warm period. So we're not going to spur new vegetative growth. It's going to make sure it all sets into fruiting growth. Um, and so by cutting, you do trigger growth if it's at a growing season. 
time of year. So the other thing that I'm going to cut probably this weekend is I've got a yew hedge which I planted from some tall straggly specimens that were thrown out at a nursery. And so I'm actually going to, I've got instead of a hedge, I've got basically a series of hedging plants. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut round inside the plants. So and people often cut a hedge on the outside to make the hedge grow nice and flat, but they don't cut the bits between the two plants where they don't meet up. But if you do cut the insides, or i.e. all round the plants, you'll make those shoot and you'll make the hedge knit together. Um, and then for something like that, I'll obviously use a hedge cutter, um, which I love. I have a lovely cordless hedge cutter, and this is a breeze. Um, I could just do this one here. And the bigger, I find these bigger hedge cutters on these little shapes are much nicer to use. It's easier to get a, a, a nice shape. And these are really light because they're cordless. It's got the um, battery that's recharged. Um, so I'll use that for my hedge cutting. For my quince trees, which is another plant that I um, prune now, I've got some lovely quince trees, I don't need longer in my courtyard. They're ornamental. Quince are absolutely renowned for being rather unruly shape. And because we've had a very wet summer, really comparatively, they have grown a lot. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cut them back. I'm going to open them out. I'm going to get more light into the plants I've got growing underneath because they're getting a bit shaded out. And I'm going to make the quince look a little less unruly. So I'm going to go and cut some more meaty shoots out of that. Um, and I'm cutting them now again because I don't want to trigger lots of vegetative growth, which I would do, which would make them even more unruly next year. I want to restrict their growth and get more fruiting wood so I'm going to do it now and I'm either going to use this which is my favorite meaty pruning tool it's like a chainsaw um, but it's not you know if even if you're a wuss you don't feel worried using it I wear goggles with it but you don't have to get dressed up in the Kevlar gloves and stuff and you see that's got a nice little blade and that will slice through something 60 70 um, millimeters diameter if I'm not going as big and don't need to use him then I'll use these these are very old and well used but they will get through something quite nice and, and I really like using those so my summer pruning so far we've done restricted fruit trees like the espalier or the devil pitchfork in pots we've done the hedging plant my yew hedging to make it bush out more um, we've done um, my quince trees and then other ornamental trees so in my garden, because we've had this wet summer, a lot of my trees and things have got quite overblown. We've got lots of new extension growth. And they basically, if we then get lots of autumn, winter storms, they're going to get torn away. So I will go round now and I'll probably shoot, reduce their shoots back to about two thirds, reduce it back to a third. So I'll remove two thirds of a long new shoot just to stabilize it really and, and to, where it gets in the way over a path or whatever and I can do it in a way that I can see that I'm forming a nice shape I'm not butchering it I'm doing it quite sensitively and even in my orchard which I can just see over there my new orchard I can see there's a lot of new growth this year probably too much and I want to reduce it back so even on my main freestanding orchard trees I'm going to go this weekend and I'm going to cut out some of those long growths that I can see over there so it's a great time to prune um, feel confident in nature nothing gets pruned apart from by the wind it knocks out dead bits of wood and things like that um, so don't get too hide bounded if you do it wrong one year then you won't do it wrong another year now i did have a few more recorded questions pre record pre sent in questions for the session and one of them i remember was about forsythia and i think it's a common problem that people have is is you know when should you prune or forsythia and this is because the forsythia i'm just trying to find her here is growing over and getting in the way and it's flopping down and she wanted to know the question i wanted to know how she should prune it and it's from judith and she says this year my forsythia bush has grown so much that the branches are hanging over should I cut it back now? And if so, will it flower next spring? Now, I like this one because it just 
highlights a question that is common. But basically, Forsythia flowers early spring, doesn't it? Comes out, lovely thing in March or so, February, March. If I went in and cut back my Forsythia now, because the flower buds have all been initiated this, this year, um, and I cut it now, I would have no flowers next spring. So you would always normally prune a Forsythia directly after flowering, okay? So if it's really driving her bonkers and it's too overhanging, she could cut back judiciously, I can't say that word, now, uh, uh, just to get the ones that are really driving her mad and then do a proper prune next spring. So that, that's the same with most plants. As a rule of thumb guide, is cut back immediately after flowering. Um, and if you know that, then, then it keeps you on the right track. So if it's flowering later on in the summer, then really you can cut it back in the winter or the spring generally. Now, the other um, ones that we also had that I thought were really relevant to this session were, um, was, and one was, is it best to prune a tree hard before it's moved or let it establish and then prune it. And this is quite critical really. So if you're moving a plant and it's been in growing in the ground quite happily for two or three years, but it's in the wrong place and you want to move it, um, what I would do was I would definitely cut it back before you move it. Because when you cut a plant back, um, you reduce the shoot to root ratio. And when you're moving it, you want to have good healthy roots and you don't want them to have to feed such a big expanse of top growth so if you cut it back the roots aren't having to work so hard so I would cut it back quite heavily um, and if it's a really big shrub that's been in there for a long time five six ten years I would root prune it by spading all the way around the circle or maybe just a half circle one year and then spade prune around the other roots the next year and then the following year lift it so that's for a really big one and then when you sever the when you lift it you sever the roots underneath and so then it's got less trauma um, but things are root pruned in nurseries all the time and there was another question from someone who said that um, she had planted lots of plants um, so that one was from ML, that question about pruning a tree. So there you are, ML, there's your answer. And then someone else said that she'd planted lots of trees about three years ago and she wanted to divide the herbaceous plants that were growing around them. Let me just try and find that one. And the question was if she, here it is, it's from Kate. Hi Kate. I want to lift and divide plants in some of my borders, but tree roots are in the way. I'm nervous of cutting through them for, de dam for fear of damaging the trees, which were planted three years ago. So I wouldn't worry. People root prune trees all the time in the nursery trade because they want to have nice, compact, confined roots for when they move the plants. That's assuming they're not container grown. Um, and really, even if she went in and because she was dividing, she removed 50% of that tree's roots because it's a young tree just established I really don't think she would harm them and I'm sure she will not be damaging anything like that percentage of roots if she's just dividing a few clumps around them. So that's the end of the summer pruning session. Um, I hope you're going to send in lots of questions about it too because I'm sure there are many many queries on it but from here we're going on to from actually cutting back and restricting growth, we're now going on to starting new growth and we're going to do sowing seeds for this time of year. You might wonder why I'm watering my wheelbarrow, but this section is all about sowing seeds. And when I'm sowing seeds, I like to start off with a good moist compost and then I sow the seeds. So I tip the water into the barrel. I've got a barrel full, which will probably fill about 10 or 15 of my seed cells for me. Um, I just stir it around to make sure it's all nicely moist with this wonderful little tool there, trial with its lost handle. Um, and then I, I use the compost, a multi-purpose compost. I don't use a seed sowing compost. The only difference being really is that this has more fertilizer in it and that just keeps them going a little bit longer, which I actually like. So we did have one question that was sent in that's particularly pertinent for the top of this item. And this is from Colin. And he's asking how easy is it to grow vegetables from seed? And I imagine the reason that he sent that in is because he's been seduced by the many adverts of 
vegetable plug plants. And you can buy them lovely little plugs. They come straight to your door and they start you off. And that is fine, but obviously the cost differential is massive. And sowing seeds, vegetable seeds, is really very easy, as long as you realize a few key facts. And one of them is that they need water to germinate, hence moistening the compost, and the correct temperature. Light isn't usually so critical. So what I do is I sow them all in cells. Now I used to, way, way back, um, I used to sow them direct in the ground, but I found the success rates were so minimal compared to sowing them in plug trays that I've totally converted to plug trays. And I use these wonderful plug trays, which I got from my mum. As you can see, they, they're sort of past their prime. And I like them because they've got these lovely holy bottoms. Uh, and now you might think that's strange and doesn't everything fall, fill through there, but it doesn't. You see, what I do when I start the bottom one off is I have this piece of polystyrene board and I put the tray on top of the board and then I fill it straight from the barrel. And I will usually do, if I'm sowing about 10 trays at once, I might have two varieties in one tray. I don't always want a lot of the 65 plants or whatever it is in a tray of one thing. And I do think that's one thing we all do as gardeners. Um, is that we sow the whole packet and really how many people want 65 spinach plants for a family of two straight away. It's much better just to sow a bit of a packet and then save the rest for another sowing and do more and more successional sowing. Now, I suppose the key question is why am I talking about sowing vegetables now, seeing as we're at the end of August? But I find it's a fantastic time to sow a lot of veg and a lot of hardy uh, annuals and biennials in the flower garden too. Um, so what I think is the bonus of sowing now is that things like um, fennel, dill, coriander, spinach, those key bolters that if you sow them with great excitement in sort of May, June, you'll find they will very quickly go up to flower, i.e. they bolt. So you have none of the luscious leaves, you just have a load of the um, uh, flower heads, which are actually pretty useless in most cases. So I push them in there and I firm them down. I like them to be pretty compact, the, the compost. I don't want it to be too loose, I want it pretty compact. Um, and as you see, some of these trays I'm not filling because they're broken on the sides or something like that, because they are pretty old. Um, now, it might be frustrating for you to think, where on earth do I buy these? And you won't find them anywhere, I don't think. And I remember when I, they were photographed in the Telegraph for something I did, and Charles Dowding rang me up. You know, Charles Dowding, the great no dig man, he rang me up and said, oh, Bunny, where did you get your polystyrene trays? Mine have all fallen to bits and I want some more. And we both searched and we couldn't find any. And so he has now actually developed his own version, not polystyrene because they're so unenvironmentally friendly now. And so he's got his own version of these. And I'd hope to show you one, but it didn't quite arrive in time. But look online and he's selling those. And I think I'll use those when I finally run out of these. So I, if you see here, I've got different trays of different lengths. So basically I've cut some of these wider trays into smaller trays. Why? And that's because they fit into these galvanized trays. Now, as I said, seeds like moisture to germinate, but also as important, they like the correct temperature. And different seeds like different temperatures to germinate. So what I do, uh, because, and also you want your seeds to germinate as fast as possible, because the first seed that germinates in a batch will always be the most health, healthy, the most vigorous. Because in that little seed, they have all the energy they need to germinate. And if they're taking six weeks to germinate, they use up all that stored energy and then they just can't quite make it. Um, so you want them to germinate quickly. And it's very important, I think, to, to find a list or look at the correct temperature to germinate of each thing. And then you know you're on the right lines. And so I have different areas where I germinate different things. Now, this time of year, it's all pretty warm. Um, and so it's not so critical. I mean, I have brought you my parsley. It's my French flat leaf parsley, which I love, which I 
sewed on the 20, well, I sewed it just under two weeks ago. Now, parsley is notoriously slow to germinate. It's one of the four difficult ones because, again, the embryo is not fully developed when, when the seed is formed and it will go on developing after you've sown it and it will often take two weeks or more to germinate. And you can see these I germinated in my greenhouse, which is not heated, but I did have this magic little perfect looking heated mat. Now you can see this is not in its prime stage of use and it's had many years of good hard use, uh, use but it, it plugs into a socket in my greenhouse um, and it keeps it warm. And with a bit of bottom heat, something like parsley will germinate very fast. So I have one air thing like that. I then have a place by my arga in the kitchen. And when I'm germinating things like tomatoes and cucumbers, cucumbers will germinate in like 24 hours next to the arga at that high temperature. Tomatoes, peppers, things like that also want the heat. So they'll germinate right by the arga. Um, and then I have my greenhouse with my heated mat or without my heated mat. And then I have my windowsill trays in the kitchen, which is warm, or I put them in a cooler room um, if I'm running out of space or I don't need the heat. So check what temperature your seeds like best to germinate first. Um, now I mentioned parsley being difficult. And I had another question in advance on this, and I thought it was interesting. It was from Margaret, and she says she always has a problem with germinating parsnips. Now, parsnips are one of the four slow ones to germinate. Like parsley and carrots and celery, they all have these uh, seeds that are not fully mature. The embryos are not fully mature, so they will take two good weeks. Now, if Margaret's sowing her parsnip seeds in February, which some packets tell you to do, and it's very cold and not very nice, um, then she will find that they might be in the ground for, it could be six weeks and there's still no show. So the chances that they're so vulnerable to pests, to birds scratching them up, to whatever, to mice, so it's very, very difficult if she sows them straight in the ground. But if she chooses an F1 variety, and I often use Gladiator or Countess, um, then they are F1, so they're selected seeds, they're uniform, they're very vigorous. They've got the F1 vigor to them. They will germinate much quicker, much faster, sorry, and they will grow much faster. And so I can be sowing those F1 hybrid parsnips right up to really beginning of April, and they will still form stonking nice roots by September or October. Though having said that, I always like to wait till after the first frost to lift my parsnips, because then the sugars from the leaves go down to the root and they do taste a lot better. Though the last few winters, we haven't been having the frosts away past Christmas, so I get a bit greedy and lift them and there we are. But so that's the thing. So if you're doing celery, parsnips, carrots or parsley, do them in cells, do them on a heated mat or in a warm place. And as soon as they've come up, um, you see, so these, these little um, parsley that I've shown you, I will, um, I'll probably lift them out when they, uh, I'll let a few more germinate. I see some are still coming up with the little seed on the top. I'll probably wait a week or two and then I'll pop them out and I'll put them either in my cold frame or I'll put them outside in a raised bed or some in each probably so I've got different um, maturities at different times which is obviously a good thing with vegetables not only do we sow too many seeds at the same time so we have all the crops at one time we want to really try and stagger everything as much as we can to keep us eating more over a longer period. So we've said about bolting, um, but I'm just going to show you some of the seeds which I'm going to be sowing now. Now, these are the vegetable seeds which I've got from Frankie, which is an Italian firm. And I, I, just ha I do use Frankie quite a lot. Um, they have, although they are from Italy, they have many, many um, varieties which are equally good here. And for instance, the spinach, which is a really good one. So this one, if I sow it now, I could be picking in November in the, in the cold um, in my polytunnel, or I should be picking sort of April, March, April, which will be lovely. And those baby leaves are just fantastic. I'll sow some radishes, which I'll be having probably in a well, way before Christmas. Some carrots I'll get in. It's quite late for carrots, but they'll work really well. Some beet, that's, that's charred, and that is really good at not bolting. Um, and that will go on for a good couple of years, I'm hoping. 
And I love this purple chicory. This is so good over winter. It looks surreal when you see these lovely, firm, bright purple heads with the white ribs in the winter with frost all around it. And they're so nice on the coleslaw. And this one, I love spigarello, which many people don't know, but and they don't usually tell you to sow it now, but I often sow it now and I'll be picking it probably before Christmas and then all through the hungry gap, which is that period in sort of March, April, beginning of May. And that's a winner. You can use the, the tops and the leaves and the shoots, every bit of it. So that's a great one. And this is a, a it's called Sima de Rapa, and it's a sprouting turnip top and it's really is specifically used with pasta dish it's an italian pasta dish called orecchiet sorry it's orecchiet my italian is really really bad uh, almost as bad as my french and um you you get the orecchiet type pasta which has little ears that's a lot easier to say and you mix it with this sima de rapa and it's a wonderful wonderful dish and i have a lot of pasta dishes here and then of course miscanza lettuce that's a mixed leaves for cutting and uh, they're cut and come again and they're brilliant and i'll be cutting these way before christmas and in the spring and i've got always with frankie you have a lot of seeds in the pack so they are good value for money uh, and i mentioned the fennel before which is uh, i love fennel i mean people say fennel is really difficult uh, to grow but i grow it as baby fennel and if you sow it in sort of july august it won't bolt i'll plant it quite closely together when i plant it out from the little modules and i'll be picking i mean last year i sowed it even later and i was picking lovely little bulbs in sort of um, february march uh, the year after which I thought was phenomenal and they were just crispy nice young fennel they weren't the huge big ones like the supermarket ones but they were every bit as tasty um, so that's a great one and then uh, obviously for the biennials and the hardy annuals now I did sow um, some dianthus um, so this is the next stage so from these if they're not going into a row in the vegetable bed outside or they're not going into the ponley tunnel these dianthus barbarata and their sooty that lovely dark purple one these have actually been potted on because i haven't got room in my beds to plant them out now so i put them in these little pots and i'll keep them in a cold frame or a cold greenhouse or something and then when i've got room and it might be october it might be next march april i'll harden them off and then i'll plant them out and then i'll have lovely color later on next year and that's lovely to get a color hit other annuals or hardy annuals that you might do things like or layer or would be really good now and uh, serinthi there's quite a few varieties of serinthi that you might want to sow now um, also i've just sown some seeds from my perennial stocks again they're a sort of a biennial or a short leaf perennial and i harvested the seeds for my own plants because they're very difficult to get and i've just sown them there so it's a, a great time to sow many things to keep your garden really going i think a lot of people tend to think gardening is in the summer but i like to drag it all through the year because although you don't want to go out in the garden in the winter as soon as you're out there and you get into your stride you love it and you don't want to come in and if you can have veg homegrown veg throughout the winter and early spring months i think it really improves your diet no end and everybody says now isn't it you should be eating 30 different varieties of plant a, a week that can be fruit and veg and i think when you've got your own garden that's dead easy to do more difficult if you're shopping from the supermarket because you cannot buy this range of plants and that's another the reason getting back to Colin he would never find something like spigarello I'm sure in any supermarket or vegetable thing so you can grow a much wider all by buying plug plants so you can grow a much much wider range of bed vegetables if you choose seed so we've talked about temperature now and then the pests so we do have less pests when we sow in plugs inside or in a cold frame but we do have some, and one of the big ones is slugs. Even up on my bench, when I put these all out on the bench, if I haven't put something to deter the slugs, I will find little plants just snapped off and you'll just see the stalk with no head and they've gone and taken that beautifully succulent top. So I use slug pellets and I use something called um, ferric phosphate which is the one that's replaced the old metal dilahide tablets which are nice or pellets which are now totally banned but the ferric phosphate ones are much more environmentally friendly and 
if they're indoors in a covered space where birds aren't going to come and eat them, I think you're, you are really safe in using these. And you can see on my parsley tray, you can see some bits of old ferric phosphate tablets. Now these you can see are slightly fuzzy because these ones were not a particularly good grade of them. They, they actually become quite fungusy quite quickly. Um, they do vary in how resilient to wet they are, but obviously a seed tray is a perfect damp, warm environment for fungal growth as well as for slugs. Um, so, the, the, you know, try and find one that is more resistant to fungal growth because then they last longer. Um, and the other big pest, obviously, when you're sowing peas or beans, is the old mice. And these are a problem because you'll sow a whole tray of seeds and you'll come back maybe a day later and you'll see one or two peas chewed up and things on the top. And then you'll come back three days later and you'll find the whole lot. You know, they've discovered it. The whole family have come in. They've had a sort of massive feast and they've all gone. Um, and so when I've sown my peas and beans, what I do to actually deter them totally is I have this rather strange Heath Robertson approach. And I have these funny old things. They needn't be like this. They could just be too high things to support this wonderful dish on the top and you I put this on the top and I put it so the overlap each side and the ends is such that any mice running up could not run underneath that up and over the top and I tell you that fools them all the time they cannot do it they don't like this overlap bit so I do that and then I put a load of trays in there and then once they've gone and they're nice size and they've gone out then obviously they've come out of there so there's the trot I used that for some cool ducks I was given that was their little temporary pond until they went to the big wide world but it's quite useful for that but now it's even more useful for the vegetables um, so let's get back to the actual sewing business um, so here is the tray with the bit of thing on the bottom the polystyrene sheet on the bottom to stop it coming out I put it down there and if I'm going to sew something I always write the labels first so I I, I get out the labels. I write down a label for each seed packet, the date, uh, the person who's selling the seeds, because I think that's useful to know if they all fail. You want to know who to pick up the phone, because it's not always your fault and say, look, you've got a duff batch of seeds here. They haven't germinated. And I notice on this pack of seeds, which is for my lovely Papaver, it's a poppy nudicol champagne bubbles white. So it's a lovely hardy annual or perennial white poppy, which I'm going to sow now, an Iceland poppy. I noticed on the back it says, on testing, germination of these seeds was below normal. To compensate, we have substantially increased the packet contents. Please allow for this one saying, well, I bet they only found out that when people rang up to complain. Um, so if something doesn't work and you think you've done it all right, do do that, you know, do tell them I think it's wrong. And I think generally if you use commercial seeds available to commercial growers, they have to be of a really high content or they would go out of business. So if you can find a commercial supplier, that can be really good. Now these seeds are absolutely tiny. So what a lot of people do is they get a match or something and they just lift the end, uh, wet the end, and then they stick it in and, and pick up a few on the end and then just push them up. So that's one technique. Some people mix them with sand but I'm going to be more daring. I'm going to put them into the palm of my hand. And um, as always, although it looks a tiny bit of dust, um, I don't like the wind here. I'm just going to sprinkle them very quickly over the top. Now, because these are so fine, I'm not even going to push them in. And I will no doubt have more than one seed in each cell quite a few times um, as I have with the parsley. With the parsley I'll just leave like that. With these when I pop them on I will actually um, separate them out. So I can see them going in quite nicely and these are the probably the most difficult when they're little. Uh, when you get a nice big seed it's, it's much easier. You can almost feel them with your fingers how many are going down actually. There we are, and then I put the label in. Now when I'm doing a bigger seed, that you can just pick one from the finger, unless I'm multiple slowing, and then I'll just put it in and I'll just lightly press it under. 
push it in with the finger, lightly press it down. And I find that is the best way to get really good contact between the compost and the seed. With those little ones, they'll just sit on top. So I think that just about wraps it up. We want temperature, which we've shown how we get different temperatures. We've got the seeds to sow now. We've got the cell trays. Um, we've got how to avoid mice. And so now we're going to go on and do the next most important thing, which is all about irrigation and watering. I am very mean with my watering. And I think that is because here we do not have any mains water. We just have our own spring water, um, which is great. But when we first came for the first 25 odd years, I was just worried that it might stop completely in a dry summer. So I was really, really cautious. Now I've discovered it's actually the pump that was faulty. The supply is fabulous. So I could water much, much more, but I still have that sort of mean attitude. It's sort of instilled in me now, I think. But having said that, I think watering is one of the most tricky aspects of gardening. And generally, people will just splash on a bit of water on the leaves and take the can away. And what they don't realise is just by wetting the leaves, the water just sits and makes the soil look wet, but actually it's only gone into the very, very top millimetre or so. And so if you do that frequently, just that very top bit of soil is wet, then the roots will grow up to the moisture rather than going down. And you want those roots to go really down. So you must remember, if you're going to water, don't water too frequently and water decent quantities. So having said that, obviously, there are crops that you do need to water. And there are certain really thirsty crops, things like tomatoes, celery, cauliflower, courgettes. Um, they all really need quite a bit of moisture to keep going. And with something like celery, some people will water it daily or at least weekly. And so if you, if you want to grow celery well, I think you need to do that. Um, then with something like tomatoes, um, the thing is with any plant that is fruiting and flowering, they will, as soon as they start fruit, fruiting and flowering, they stop their root growth. And so what happens is if they, if it's very dry, normally a root would go out to find new water, but if it's very dry in the fruiting or flowering, it, they won't, so they will suffer. So whenever a plant is fruiting or flowering, just watch it carefully. And as soon as you see any signs of even slight distress, then go and water them. Now with my tomatoes, I only water my ones in my greenhouse probably about once a week. And that is because I use capillary matting. And I've got two samples here. This is an expensive capillary, mat capillary matting. That's the side that goes on the bench. And then that's the side that sits up on the top. Um, and that's more expensive and it lasts a lot longer than the cheaper version, which is made from shoddy, I think, old clothes and things, um, which, which is, uh, lasts two, three years, something like that. But the reasons these work is that they actually hold all the water so the plant roots can go down and draw it up from a much bigger surface area. And I find that invaluable. If I've got pot plants that I haven't planted into the garden, I will often put on a bench or outside and put them on some capillary matting. And they grow much better. The root system will go all through the pot rather than just straight down to the bottom and around the edges, which they normally do when you grow plants in pots. So there are some crops that you just don't really need to water at all and onions, uh, even to get those lovely big onions and sprouts. So the other thing that's really critical of watering is, as I said before, don't put too little on. So whenever you're watering vegetables, I would never do less than two gallons per square yard. And a normal big size can, not that one here, but a normal big size can usually holds two gallons. And it's worth, it's worth seeing that. And obviously, it takes account of how much moisture that's come from the sky as to whether you need to water, how good your soil is, because if you've got really moisture retentive soil, then you'll need to water less. And if you want to reduce your watering, obviously if you water in early spring and then you put a good mulch on, you will keep the moisture in the soil. So those are all good tips. If you, if you are a massive overwater and you're really splashing it on, you're gonna get bigger crops but you probably will have a lot less flavour. And why are we growing homegrown? We're growing it for the flavour, aren't we? Because it's so different. So it seems a little bit um, counterproductive to go and 
make it so flavorless by chucking on lo loads more water and they have less nutrients in them too if you over water. Someone actually submitted a question in advance on watering and that's a very common query that people have is do I water in the morning or do I water in the evening? Now there are different schools of thought on this but generally I like to water in the evening because I think then the water really soaks into the soil and it lasts there longer, it goes perhaps a little bit deeper and then the plant can draw on it. Whereas if, you, if it's the morning and it's going to be a hot day, it doesn't seem to, the cut plant can't enjoy the moisture for so long either. So generally I always say in the evening. The other thing that people often do is when they're water, water seedlings, which obviously are quite delicate. They've got nice tender little uh, shoots and, and cotyledons, the seed leaves. And so you really don't want to be splashing water on them any old how. You want a lovely fine mist. And so for this, I tend to use this can here. And this has got a fine rose on it and the rose if you can see the fine, lovely fine rose there, and the rose is actually facing upwards. Again, counterintuitive, it's not facing down. And if, imagine I had my seed trays out on the ground in front of me here, I would start watering, nice fine mist, and then I pull it over the trees, the, the trays. So I'll just do it nice and thoroughly and regularly over the trays, so you're not actually doing it. And then before it runs out, you make sure you move it off and then you lift it up. And that's a very simple technique, but I tell you, it's loads better than dobbing a load of water in, in the wrong place. Well, I think we've just come to the end of this first session of um, Gardening Hacks. I really hope you've enjoyed it.